The first order of business this afternoon is to present the Ken Norris Lifetime Achievement Award to Randy Reeves. Um, I cannot think of a better candidate for this. For those who know Ken Norris um, or knew him, um, he was a great scientist, a great mentor, um, but above all, a, a kind and gentle person. And um, for that reason alone, I think this is especially appropriate. I'm going to give a little bit of background on Randy. His only plea to me was, make it short, don't eat into my time. Uh, but there's a lot to cover. Uh, Randy has authored or co-authored a 150 peer review paper. 90 of those were his first author, and that those who keep track of those, that sort of thing <clears throat> in your own record know how it's outstanding that is. Um, he's been the chair of the IUCN Cetacean Specialist Group forever, um, at least 20 years, I think. Uh, he's the chair of the U.S. Marine Mammal um, Commission Scientific Advisors. He's been co-chair of the COSIWIC here in uh, Canada. He's a uh, binational um, U.S. Canadian. Uh, he's uh, serve a, the Vaquita recovery team um, a member, and he's been on virtually every other conservation com committee having to do with cetacean that you could possibly name. Um, and you, if you don't know him for all those things, at least you probably know him for his, his field guides uh, to marine mammals. But I had to dig a little bit deeper than that, because I could find that on a CV. <laughs> Turns out that Randy was valedictorian of his high school class. He was the first Nebraska student to pole vault over 14 feet. He was a Coca-Cola quarterback of the year, high school quarterback of the year. Uh, he was an academic All-American in college. Uh, his degrees are in history, public affairs, and geography. So if you think you have to get a biology degree to be a preeminent marine mammologist, forget about it. It's not necessary. Um, this slide shows, I think the arrow there is pointing to Randy's butt, but uh, <laughs> this is the uh, Nebraska versus IWC game. Um, he was quite a slouch, as you, as you saw in his early youth, and he didn't publish his first marine mammal paper in 1975. When the IUCN Cetacean Specialist Group learned that, that Randy was receiving this award, there was an outpouring of support, and I think that uh, David um, summed up all of our feelings very well. I don't know anyone more deserving. Your tireless work over all those years has made a big difference in the lives of the marine mammals around the globe. Um, Jill Brolick was nice enough to arrange for all of those nice congratulations to be put into a book, plus all the congratulations of the members here. There's been a secret conspiracy behind your back to, uh, to, to, to do this. Thank you, Jillian. Randy has what will undoubtedly be a uh, outstanding presentation for us, because he always does. <laughs> He's sweating this one. <laughs> and we have a nice plaque for you. Come on up and, and get your rewards. Thank you. You don't think Jay ate enough into my time, but thank you anyway. Uh, I don't know how I'll manage now. 
Also, I don't know where he got that football picture. That's, that's going to be a story I'll get later on from him, I hope. I want to say a little bit about the context of this award as I see it. Uh, those of you who were here for the last few days will have appreciated, as do I, the intelligence, I would call it brilliance, eloquence, passion, dedication on display by the other speakers, uh, plenary speakers, Asha, Scott, Julie, Hal, Nigel, young and old people, um, you know, in our society and in, in our community. Um, I was especially touched by the in memoriam video that Ann Paps so masterfully put together on Monday. That was great because it showed all of us some of the context in which we've grown up and worked in this field. Um, basically, I want to say that I'm touched and honored, deeply honored by this award and very much humbled by realizing the kind of people who are here and have, have been in this, in this game that we play uh, for so long. So before launching into my presentation, uh, Jill insisted that I give some initial thoughts of my own rather than starting on river dolphins right away, so I'll do that right now. Um, around 40 years ago, I got interested in right whales, and one of the first things that I did was um, put a paper together with Jim Mead and Steve Katona on the handful of, ob or the few observations that were available then of right whales on the U.S. East Coast and Canadian East Coast. Uh, it was published in the IWC report series, and here you'll see the irony, I hope, in my 40, or our 40 year out of date comments. Uh, if I can get this thing to go, yeah, okay. So I, I'm sure those of you who work on right whales will appreciate these. We described accidental entanglement and, uh, as probably exceptional. We claim there was no evidence to indicate that such entanglement happened often or that it invariably led to death or debilitation. But that it shouldn't be overlooked as a potential hazard to individual whales and therefore may be an obstacle to recovery of this small stock. That wasn't that long ago that that was, I guess you could say, a mainstream view. Um, anyway, let's see. Next. Regarding ship strikes, we said that it's hard to know how often, if at all, right whales are killed by ships. But at least we had the good sense to cite the fact that other whale species were sometimes and maybe right whales were susceptible to collisions or strikes as well. So starting in 1980, uh, Scott Krause gave me the opportunity to work with him and a few others in the Bay of Fundy watching right whales from a small plane, the New, New England Aquarium, from a small plane and from the New England Aquarium small boat, the Nereid. Also in the early 1980s, my wife, Randy, who I want to say is at least as deserving of at least half of this award as I am, by the way. She's right down here. <laughs> she was employed as a seasonal naturalist in St. Andrews, New Brunswick, and we spent many enjoyable late summer and autumn days on the water with right whales, witnessing what looked like a beginning of a recovery. And yes, she was young once, and I don't know who the guy is with her. I really don't recognize him any more than you do. Uh, and over the decades since then, I, I became cautiously optimistic about the right whales um, and thought they were on the road to recovery. But in the last few years, and above all this year, it's become ever harder to be even cautiously optimistic, I'm afraid. But the second thing I want to make some initial comments about is the vaquita, because I got plugged into vaquita issues in the mid-1990s and have been engaged in various ways, including on the committee of, uh, well, CIRVA, the Recovery Committee, and most recently on the Mexican President's Advisory Committee, or Commission on Vaquita Recovery. Um, everyone here is by now well aware of the sad story of the vaquita. 
Uh, and at this point, I, all, I want to acknowledge the absence of some of my closest and longstanding friends and colleagues in this field who would almost certainly be here were it not for the valiant work they're doing in the Gulf of California right now. That's Francis Gulland and Rand Andy Reid in the bottom left and uh, Randy Wells up in the top left. Barb Taylor talking, having a chat with the Mexican president and um, Peter Thomas standing in the, at whale camp in Argentina where he did his PhD on, on uh, right whales. These are just some of the people that are missing from the conference and uh, who I'm sure are in all of our thoughts. So I've wished, having, having witnessed close up and firsthand the Baiji's demise, the Yangtze River Dolphin, then the Vaquita's death spiral, and now the rapid deterioration of the North, North Atlantic right whales situation. When I, even when I chose to believe things were turning around for it, I, never, I find it ever harder to get up for the next so-called crisis. But unfortunately, more are on the way, and I'll be mentioning a few of them today. Uh, Jill also pushed me to say a few words about what might be lessons learned that I've learned along the way. But to be honest, I'm not sure I've learned any that have really sunk in and will actually work for the next problem. But several things I'll just mention. First of all, this is a point that Scott made really well in his talk on Monday and that is that extinction can happen fast. And it sounds almost trite to say that, but it's frightening how fast it can. And uh, a couple years ago, as you'll recall, at this conference, or the, or the previous biennial, the uh, award for conservation action was given to the folks from Mexico and some of the other scientists from outside uh, who had been working on vaquita recovery. And at that time, we were all sad but excited because we, we thought that with the support of the Mexican government, which was finally there, uh, there was really a chance. And that's two years ago, and by now, it's, it's as desperate as you know it to be. So, um, I want to share with you these, these words too. I don't know how many of you know Steve Katona, but um, my principle here that I want to share is never be complacent and never let yourself become convinced that you truly understand the forces at work to undo what you believe to be progress. Steve published these words in a paper back in 19, early 1990s, and I'll let you read it. I won't repeat it here for, to save some time. I'll come back to it at the end of the talk. All too often, the critical difference in determining whether a species or population survives or doesn't hinges on attitudes, desires, or expectations, which are often called needs, that science doesn't even touch. In fact, regardless of how fashionable it has become to point to social science as what's needed, we need more social science, um, even that, I'm afraid, can be completely irrelevant in the face of the, kinds of, uh, face of the kinds of powerful forces operating against efforts to save what's left of nature. Finally, uh, at risk of opening Pandora's box and getting people really excited, I just have to mention that I wonder if and how we will ever be come to terms with the problem of our inability or unwillingness to remove any cetaceans from the wild as a proactive measure to hedge against last minute scrambles like the one underway right now in Mexico. Okay, those are my initial thoughts. Now I'll get on to the main topic that was promised. Uh, it should be obvious quickly during this talk that Jill Browlick and Brian Smith have provided a lot of the insight, help and encouragement for it and we plan to publish the paper in Marine Mammal Science together. Um, Yeah, the, this is a basic outline of the talk. I'll just keep going, though, because first I want to talk about what I, we call the taxonomic context and with a few words on the current status of the various uh, freshwater species. 
The Committee on Taxonomy of this society recognizes 36 living genera of cetaceans, including the Bygee, which is not living anymore. Uh, six of those genera are what we have decided to call either freshwater obligates, meaning they live their entire, all, all animals, all the species and so forth in the genus are all freshwater dwelling animals, or freshwater, freshwater facultatives, which means that uh, the genus contains at least one species or population that lives in freshwater. And this small set of taxa, and here I use the term taxa to apply it to populations, I hope you forgive that, um, have been significant, there, have significant differences in ancestry, morphology, behavior, group size and composition and so forth, but they also have important similarities, not the least of which is their high risk of severe depletion or even extinction simply because of where they live. So the first obligate is the Baiji or Yangtze River Dolphin, which is known only from the Yangtze River Basin in China. Uh, and its, its range was from near Three Gorges all the way down the river to the mouth at Shanghai. And these two big lakes were also important areas for Baiji's the, the linear distance of the range was about 900 nautical miles or 1,700 kilometers. And I, and I talk about the Baiji in the past tense uh, because I, and I think most people, believe that it really is gone, uh, even though on the IUCN red list it's called critically endangered still, uh, with parentheses possibly extinct. We have a new uh, assessment coming out in December uh, describing it or classifying it as truly extinct. But I will say that there is a, I mean, I feel obliged to say there's a small crack in the door. Uh, this month, October 2017, uh, an amateur group in China is, is out there right now, I think, looking for um, Baijis in the area around Tongling, where they say that they saw one or two several years ago. And we, I mean, this is the kind of thing that seems to always ensue when a species goes extinct. But uh, I mean, who knows? Let's, let's not close the door totally shut yet on the Baiji. Another obligate is the um, genus Platanista. And I'll say a good deal more about that later. These, these South Asian river dolphins are certainly not extinct, but they are definitely endangered and they have been for a long time. They're range is uh, limited to the South Asian subcontinent. On the left up there is the um, Indus River uh, Basin. Then there's the Ganges Basin and the Brahmaputra Basin. And they also live in this little, uh, well, relatively little system called the Karnafuli in Bangladesh. So that's the total range of, of that uh, species as it's understood right now. You'll see more on the, uh, this is, yeah, that's the historical distribution. Uh, and I'll show you later how that's changed. It has for both subspecies. The taxonomy of Platonist is slightly complicated. Uh, the currently established view is that there are two subspecies, uh, the Indus dolphin of about 1,200 to 1,800 individuals, all of them in the main stem of the river, uh, no more in the um, tributaries, except one in India, but I won't talk about that. And the other is the Ganges dolphin, a subspecies, uh, which has a more varied and scattered range, a much broader range, and maybe there are 3,000, 3, maybe 3,500 or so, maybe more. I, I don't think there are less, but there's really no good estimate. Uh, both subspecies have severely fragmented modern distributions thanks to river modification projects, and I'll come back to this at some length later in the talk. Um, a third obligate is the Amazon River Dolphin, or Boto, which is the Bra Brazilian common name. Actually, that's the species in the picture. Um, 
these animals uh, occur in um, a number of disjunct river systems. Uh, the Orinoco up in Venezuela, uh, up here, and the huge Amazon system here. And this system down here, the Araguaya Tocantins, which is not connected to the Amazon, uh, people sort of overlook that, that system. Six countries, Brazil, Colombia, um, Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador, and Venezuela. They're present in all those countries still. And like Platanista, only one species is currently recognized by the Society's Taxonomy Committee. Uh, and, that's, and there are two subspecies recognized, one in, Bra one in Bolivia, uh, and then the nominate subspecies throughout the rest of the Inia Boto's range. Um, yeah, I guess I'll come back to that in a little bit too. Unfortunately, the red list status of Boto's is officially data deficient right now, but it has become one of the most seriously threatened taxa of cetaceans. I say that in spite of the fact that it still has a vast range and probably tens of thousands of animals, uh, but the assaults on its habitat and on the dolphins themselves by human activity have frightening implications. For nearly a decade now, it's been deliberately hunted in large portions of its range for fish bait. And I'll say a lot more about that later on. Finally, the fourth obligate is the tucuxi. That's another Brazilian common name that's applied to the species generally. And its range is broadly similar to that of the, similar to that of the botos, uh, except it does not occur in the Tocantins system uh, and, or in the Orinoco, although that's complicated. So I won't get into the details here now. But the, tu the tucuxi is also listed currently by IUCN as data deficient, but uh, it's subject to very high bycatch rate. It's uh, uh, probably bycaught a lot more than Botos, with which it's sympatric. Uh, fortunately, the Tukushi is not hunted as intensively as the Baiji, but it is sometimes killed, apparently, for fish bait as well. So I think one can say safely that uh, the major threat that faces freshwater cetaceans and virtually all cetaceans is uh, the bycatch issue. And of course, these dolphins living as they do in freshwater systems that are heavily populated by people are, are vulnerable to that. So the other two of the animals that we are thinking about under this rubric are the narrow-ridged finless porpoise and the Irrawaddy dolphin. Uh, the Yangtze porpoise population of uh, the narrow-ridged finless porpoise is the only uh, porpoise population that's permanently established in freshwater. Its distribution was essentially the same as the, Bi as the Baiji's. Uh, at least that was true in recent decades. Um, unfortunately, the porpoises appear headed quickly in the same direction as the Baiji. The boat survey in 2016, in which we found no Baijis, uh, produced enough data on the porpoises to come up with an estimate of about 1,800 porpoises left in the Yangtze system. Uh, and that compared already to an estimate of about 2,700 15 years earlier. Another range-wide survey in 2012 indicated that that porpoise's range, or those freshwater range, had continued to shrink and the population had declined by more than half. So the finless porpoises in the Yangtze, a, a separate subspecies, are listed as critically endangered, as they should be and probably will be for a long time. The Irrawaddy dolphin, whose name is not very fitting because that's only a very relatively small part of its range, um, its distribution is more extensive than, than implied by the name uh, Irrawaddy dolphin. It lives in nearshore waters, in estuaries, and in semi-enclosed lagoons. Um, 
The three discrete populations confined to freshwater habitat are the Irrawaddy uh, River of Burma or Myanmar, the Mekong of Cambodia, and the Mahakam of East Kalimantan, Borno, Borneo. You can see them here. There's, there's the, Kalim, uh, the Mahakam River, um, the Mekong here, little piece of river in, in the Irrawaddy. That's, what, that's more or less the range today. Uh, for those freshwater populations. And they're all listed as critically endangered, and given their small size and geographic situation, they're certain to remain critically endangered as long as they remain extant. So, let's see, the pictures. Yeah, I'm reluctant to get into this deep history thing. I wanted to spend some time talking about the um, paleontology and um, systematics of uh, these freshwater animals. A um, couple of comments though. First of all, the, um, yeah, sorry, I, I should have switched this before I started. What am I doing? Getting mixed up. Yeah, well, I'll say a few things. They're smaller, smaller, smaller cetaceans, all of them. Uh, and this is an interesting thing because I don't think it would be feasible, and I don't think there's any fossil evidence of large whales, including baleen whales, obviously, but even mid-sized things like pilot whales or killer whales uh, coming into or living permanently in freshwater systems in the past. Um, all freshwater cetaceans um, have marine lineages, and the invasions of freshwater by cetaceans have re occurred repeatedly. Uh, and in quite a few areas. Um, yeah, Jill made this map to show some of the large rivers of the world where one might expect uh, dolphins to occur, but they only occur in these specific places in uh, tropical or subtropical uh, continents or continent portions. Um, nowhere else, at least these days, although in geological time there were some other parts of the world with freshwater uh, species. An, another aspect, an aspect of paleontology uh, that has to do with uh, timing, the sequence and timing of divergence. It's well established that Platanista is the oldest lineage of any living dolphin. The genus apparently arose in the late Oligocene about 28 to 30 million years ago and Platonista is regarded as a sister taxon to all other cetaceans. Um, important point about, important conservation point about that. Platonista being as old as it is and as, as separate as it is from all others, uh, all other um, cetaceans really. Um, if we lose Platonista, the the South Asian river dolphin. We've left, lost a family, certainly, uh, but uh, the most ancient uh, lineage of, of the uh, odonocetes except sperm whales, I guess. That's, that's fair to say. Um, I want to skip along here because I don't want to hold you up longer than I have to, and I think I've overshot with these bits about... Um, paleontology and relationships, and we'll put, put this stuff in our paper, but I'll skip right ahead to the biology, uh, some of the characteristics of the animals. Uh, yeah, the three true river dolphins, which I'm talking now about the Baiji, the Boto, and the South Asian river dolphin. Uh, they have reduced eyes, and Platonista is, in fact, functionally blind. Uh, the one on the top left here, or top right, sorry. And they have large paddle-like flippers, and unfused cervical verte vertebrae, and a long rostrum with lots of sharply pointed teeth. The long, narrow beak, the large flippers, and the flexible neck, and let's face it, the flexible body, because this animal below is a, is a boto, showing how flexible it is 
provide foraging advantages in rivers characterized by a great deal of structural complexity compared to marine waters. Generalizing about the kinds of conditions where freshwater cetaceans live is tricky because they are clearly adaptable and opportunistic cons to a considerable degree. Uh, to some extent, uh, views or perspectives depend on the geographical and ecological context. This slide by Brian refers primarily to the downstream portions of the subcontinent rivers inhabited by Platanista, although the general principles of connectivity and complexity probably apply fairly generally. In some upstream areas and during floods, running water imposes severe energetic constraints, forcing the animals to concentrate in countercurrents at channel confluences and meanders, where they find refuge from downstream currents. The attractive force of the countercurrents traps nutrients and provides hydraulic refuge for the dolphins. It also concentrates fish, so it also provides good fishing grounds for people. Although some seasonal movements occur, which allows the dolphins to enter tributaries and lakes and so forth, they aren't, uh, they aren't generally migratory in the usual sense. Jill has pointed out that in the lower reaches of some rivers, especially in the Indus where she's worked, during the non-flood season, the dolphins seem to prefer high-velocity waters where scouring creates deep pools that have concentration of the fish and pose less risk of becoming stranded in shallows or cut off from the main channel. Uh, in the Indus and Ganges systems, the dolphins are often limited, at least seasonally, to, seasonally, to canal-like waterways or sometimes the reservoirs immediately above dams. There's evidence in both South America and Nepal, thanks to some great work by Clariana Arujo and John Wang here, and Shambhu Padel, who's not here from Nepal, and Grant Abel, who's taking care of caught, by, uh, caught vaquitas right now, uh, in Nepal. The dolphins congregate, as do fishermen, immediately below the dams to take advantage of fish concentrations. And this, this gives you some idea of what that looks like. There's nothing particularly noteworthy about the life history of uh, freshwater cetaceans, as far as I know. They seem to be sort of similar to other odonocetes, for the most part. Um, the long-term study by Vera da Silva and Tony Martin in Brazil is providing some solid, long-needed, uh, seriously hard data on botos, and presumably tukushis, tukushis as well. Uh, although those data haven't been uh, worked up yet, but so the information on this slide comes primarily from them on the botos, and we assume that it might be similar for the other true river dolphins, not sure. Freshwater cetaceans in general subsist on small fish and invertebrates, such as shrimp. The boto is an exception. Uh, again, Clary Aruojo, whom I mentioned before and is in the audience, she has a a little book that she produced of photographs, which are uh, incredible, and they were available here for sale. Um, but Boto's, it, she has one photo of a Boto carrying a giant catfish in its mouth that um, is more than a meter and a half long. They have um, molar-like teeth in the back of the jaw, eight to 10 pairs, and so they eat armored catfish and some turtles sometimes, and they, they apparently chew stuff, so they, they take these big catfish and just chew on them and manage to consume them. So they're an interesting anomaly, really. Again, something worth preserving. Regarding sociality and social structure, it's fair to say that freshwater cetaceans are not very gregarious, although I saw one group of about 22 botos uh, traveling fast together in the Amazon, and that's almost big enough to call them a school. Uh, I think there's a lot to be learned yet about the sociality and uh, so social lives of, of uh, the freshwater cetaceans for those of you who are looking for thesis projects. Uh, the, the upper photo here is an interesting one because it, it shows a, what I would call an adventitious 
concentration or convergence on, on prey by uh, finless porpoises in one of the big lakes on the Yangtze. I don't think that means they're social, but it does mean that they uh, can occur in big groups sometimes. Now, an interesting and worrisome thing that we learned in the Mekong in Cambodia a few years ago is the exceptionally high rate of calf mortality that was, and I'm talking neonates here when I say calf, uh, during the period from 2003 to about 2008. Francis Gulland and Paul Jepson, who might be here today, um, and a team of other crack pathologists spent a lot of time studying necropsy reports and conducting their own necropsies of, of available specimens in Cambodia, but they were unable to pinpoint a cause of death. After a good deal of deliberation with people who have spent a lot of time on the river with the dolphins in the Mekong, we are continuing to consider the possibility that the calves are dying from infanticide by rambunctious, aggressive males. In the confined, confined circumstances of a river like the Mekong, harassment would at times, if not always, be difficult to avoid or escape from. In pursuing this hypothesis, in collaboration with WWF Cambodia, the team who's working there on these animals all the time, it would be an interesting and rewarding challenge for a young, energetic behaviorist. As usual, there's a laundry list of lethal threats to freshwater cetaceans, only one of which can, can probably be considered a major threat to virtually all of them. It'll be no surprise that that's bycatch, of course. More on that in a moment. Uh, as far as we know, river, river dolphins are Freshwater cetaceans have never been and are not subject to natural predation, uh, but there are large sharks in the Amazon, and I suspect, at least sometimes, uh, they do take at least young botos and tukushis. Gillnets being the bane of uh, cetaceans globally, uh, it's no surprise that rivers and lakes are, uh, are no exception. As everyone here knows, the unintentional entanglement, sometimes hooking on long lines, which was much of the reason for the Baiji's demise, entrapment in enclosures also uh, has been and continues to be almost, and almost certainly will continue to be the leading driver of loss in terms of both numbers and species diversity for cetaceans. And disentanglement uh, is is not only a band-aid at most, it's certainly not a, a cure for this. And I, I have to say it's admirable in this, this picture with the um, netting in the teeth of a, of a Ganges dolphin being uh, removed by a group under Brian Smith's supervision. It's admirable for sure, and I'm glad that they're doing it, but it's simply no answer to the bycatch problem. Uh -huh. Now this one, I'm sorry to subject you to this, I really am, but I think, and it's gonna be up there for a little bit, but it's, I think this is one of those things that we have to uh, look at and recognize and accept. Um, as I said before, botos, as well as tukushis to some extent, have been subjected to deliberate killing since early this century, about 2000. The sole purpose is to obtain bait to attract a catfish, locally known in Brazil as piracatinga, that's in great demand in local markets and especially in Colombia for some reason. Uh, that's where the, this, this killing of dolphins to get bait began and it spread throughout a good share of the range of the, of the boto. Um, the long-term study by Da Silva and Martin that I mentioned earlier has shown uh, a, a steep decline in both species, boto and tukushi, that's clearly related to the hunting. And Brazil declared a five-year ban on the commercialization and fishing uh, of the piracatinga, this fish, back in, starting in January 2016. But apparently it has not stopped the hunting, and it remains uncertain, certainly to me, uh, if it ever will. And I can't help but liken the situation uh, there to what we watched unfold with the Baiji and then the vaquita and now with the North Atlantic right whale. 
And disturbing though it is, it's worth pointing out that in Pakistan, back in 1974, when the Platanista dolphins, the South Asian dolphins, were really in trouble uh, in, in Pakistan, in the Indus, uh, the government of Sindh province, which is where most of the dolphins are, are situated, uh, declared the, that, a, a, the particular segment of the river between two barrages as a, a, a protection area for Indus dolphins, and they cracked down on dolphin hunters, a particular ethnic group that was hunting on the land. And it seems to have worked pretty well, that top-down approach in that case. And the population has grown considerably since then, and we still have Indus dolphins uh, today. And so there is some possibility, and I think there's a lot of momentum toward, uh, toward forcing Brazil to crack down similarly and seriously uh, on the killing of botos before it's too late. Electrofishing has often been mentioned as a threat to uh, freshwater cetaceans. And, oh, man, Jay is standing. That's not good. Um, yeah. It's very hard to confirm electrocution as a cause of death, I'm told. And it's illegal throughout the areas where these dolphins occur in Asia, but it continues. Uh, and I don't, even if it doesn't kill them outright, it certainly contributes in various ways to ecological degradation, like fish depletion and social conflict. That's a big problem. This threat, uh, I wasn't sure whether I should cate categorize it as lethal or non-lethal because it doesn't really fit in either one. Stranding, the usual, in, in the usual sense we think of stranding, isn't often used with reference, reference to freshwater cetaceans for sort of obvious reasons, I think. But it does apply to dolphins or porpoises that get cut off from safe channels and become trapped in places where they are at heightened risk. Uh, this, these pictures show some efforts. That's Jill up uh, squatted in that corner picture, uh, working to return a platanista dolphin to the main river from a canal where it was entrapped. This happens fairly often in, in Pakistan. Uh, that's a Enzo Aliaga Rosel uh, rescuing a small boto from a small river where it was trapped uh, and doomed uh, quite a few years ago. Whoops, sorry. Turn that again. Jeez. Non lethal threats. I'm going to have to get started because Jay's going to cr crack down on me. So much more I wanted to say. That's a, a list of non -lethal, lethal threats. This is a slide that Brian prepared for us uh, talking about the impact of um, dams. And I want to mention that in um, Brazil, Oh my God. There are 90, 91 new dams are planned in the Brazilian Amazon, 74 already in operation, 31 under construction. There may be more than 400 dams in the whole Amazon basin eventually. I mean, just think of it, it'll, it'll be a different place. And Scott Krauss is always talking about the right whale being an urban whale and this environment being urbanized. Unfortunately, these rivers, which until very recently have been pretty remote and uh, not urban at all, are quickly becoming urbanized too. Yeah, I was going to say something about that one, but I won't bother. Um, I want to get to this one. This is something from 18, the 1870s. It shows the entire distribution, as it was known then, of uh, the Ganges and Brahmaputra dolphins. And as you can see, these, it's, their distribution was pretty much continuous and uninterrupted throughout the three river basins where they, or three or four river basins where they occurred. And some of Jill's work uh, in recent years, this, this is from her thesis work, I think, and it uh, shows basically what you saw on the previous slide, but only for the Indus River, the original distribution of the subspecies. 
And this is what it's like today with its carved up, fragmented habitat showing all the barrages and um, dams that have been built managing the water flow of the river. And this slide, I think it's too busy to talk about. I want to wrap up quickly. That was from Jill's thesis. A um, Couple of points. I'm not convinced that there was any way we could have, the so-called conservation community, or international conservation community, could have saved the Baiji. But I'm also convinced that we should have tried a lot harder than we did. But there's no question in my mind that the, our failure to save the Baiji had a salutary effect when it came to the Vaquita. I remember very well sitting, in, sitting with Barb and Jay, Barb being Jay's wife, in Bob Pittman and Lisa Balance's um, living room in San Diego, or La Jolla, soon after our 20, 2006 Yangtze survey, vowing to not let the same story unfold for the Vaquita. Yet here we are. At least this time, I can vouch for the fact that, not, that a lot of extremely dedicated individuals in and outside this society have done everything humanly possible to save the Vaquita. But once again, I'm reminded of those words from Steve Katona that I quoted earlier, that endangered species conservation mustn't be viewed as a task to complete. Laws, regulations, assigning species to various categories of threat or risk Design, designating protected areas, they're all actions that may need to be accomplished only once. But as Steve put it then, other actions need to be overseen or repeated forever or unless a decision is, or until a decision is taken that the species is secure or as was the case with the Baiji and may soon be the case with the Vaquita, it's gone forever. The two species shown here, Platonista on the top, that's Jill's favorite photo of the species, and any on the bottom, are both freshwater obligates that, unlike the Baiji or the Vaquita, still occur in vast ranges in multiple countries. This may justify at least a sliver of optimism that more can be done to save them from extinction. But obviously, we have a lot of work to do, and the problems before us in terms of species, or even more so ecosystem and biodiversity conservation, are huge and growing. But let's not let the doom and gloom paralyze us. I and I hope all of you will be leaving this conference inspired by the words and images provided by Alex Karamanlidis and Charles Litton regarding monk seals. And I'm always inspired by the incredible dedication of friends and colleagues in places like Indonesia and Taiwan and Cambodia facing desperate appearing situations. We have to support them in every way we can. That's it. I'm done. Many, many thanks, Randy. We won't have time for uh, questions, but uh, please, no. he's, <laughs> please tackle them afterwards. We are going to slide right into our business meeting, um, and we're going to do that um, um, in as quiet a way as possible. If you have to leave, uh, please do so quietly. Um, we'll begin um, the uh, members' meeting um, soon. And so if the um, members of our, our board, our elected officers, come up here, that would be very welcome. And um, Daryl, if you're here, you'll be joining us too. Kevin, can you queue up the general members meeting uh, video presentation?
<laughs> Welcome to the uh, Society for Marine Mammology's member meeting. Um, I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of what's, what's going to be presented here. Um, we're going to have several um, periods when you can give input from the floor. Um, we're going to have um, nominations. We're going to have um, other business from the floor. And uh, we'll have a, a number of things to, to vote on as well. And, um, we need, and we're going to be following um, Robert, Robert's rules of order as best as I can handle those, which is never very, <laughs> very, very good. Um, but um, we're going to have to have motions um, at various po points in the meeting, uh, motions to uh, adopt an agenda, that sort of thing. When you make a motion from the floor, uh, please uh, give your name first, and um, if you're in, in the first couple of rows, maybe you can shout and Tara can hear you, but otherwise use the, uh, the microphones. Well, we have a pretty busy schedule, um, a lot of stuff to get through, so I'm going to just uh, jump right into that. Um, the first order of business is, um, is the agenda. Can I have a motion from the floor to uh, approve the agenda? And it, do I have a second? Laura? All in favor, raise your hand. Thank you very much. Um, I meant to mention, if you're not a member, please feel free to uh, join and learn what the, the society is doing for you. Um, but uh, don't uh, please refrain from, from voting if you're a non-member. So, <laughs> excuse me. Um, next order of business. Um, at a meeting like this, typically um, there's the option of um, reading the um, minutes from the previous meeting. Um, however, those minutes have been posted online for some time now, um, so I would like to see a, a motion, hear a motion uh, to waive the reading of the minutes. Katerina, thank you. And Sarah, Sarah will take a second. Yay, the board's very active now. <laughs> All in favor? Yay, no reading of minutes. Um, the very next thing, we will ask um, Anne uh, to be prepared to come up here, but not yet. Um, but if, um, Mario, are you in the, are you near the stage? Please come up here. The next Marine Mammal Conference is going to be very, very exciting, um, not only because it's in Barcelona, yay, uh, but also it's going to be um, an equal split of responsibilities with the Society of Marine Mammalogy and the, uh, the European Cetacean Society, so I'd like uh, Mario to give his, his vision of what we have planned for you. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jay, thank you all. So the next conference is going to be in Europe. And uh, we have been invited. We have been invited to uh, co-host uh, the conference with uh, this society. We are all very excited about it. It's um, a big honor. The previous uh, joint conference happened in 98 in Monaco. It's about time we uh, get the two conferences together. And uh, it's not just going to be the SMM and the ECS. We also have other societies. We have societies from South America and uh, from Mexico and uh, Africa together. And uh, well, the uh, organizers here are going to be Yes, we have them up here. We have Manel Gazo and Carla Cicotte are going to be the local hosts, uh, taking the place of Hillary and Lara <laughs> there. <laughs> um, they are not going to be wearing hats, I guess. <laughs> and uh, I think that at this point, I would let uh, uh, Manel uh, introduce the venue. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you all there.
and more. And of course, it's going to be Manel and Carla. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Mario, and thank you, Jay. I think we have a small presentation. Uh, I don't know if I have to. It's like this. Okay, then, thank you also the, the boards. Thank you the board of the ASMM and for um, the board of the ECS. Especially thank you also, Anne, for this last month just sharing uh, emails. And also I want to especially thanks, I think it's thanks to Joan Gonzalvo, the vice chair of the ECS, to helping us on finally decide to be involved in this big, big uh, conference that, that for sure will be a, a nice time to spend all together. Uh, well, I'm Manel, she's Carla, we both worked, uh, worked in a local NGO based in Barcelona working with, with uh, marine conservation. That, as you will see, uh, I am also teaching, teaching at the University of Barcelona and Carla is uh, performing, conducting his PhD there and will be uh, co-hosted with the uh, University of Barcelona. There is a large marine mammal research group uh, led by Alex Aguilar and, well, with these two organizations, we will try to do our best for, for, put, for convince you to come together to Barcelona. It's a um, great honor to be here presenting uh, our city uh, for the next conference. Um, I'm sure that we will have to work really, really hard to get over this great conference and uh, Hillary and, and Tonia and, and also um, Sophie and, and, and uh, uh, Damien, sorry. <laughs> And Damien and their teams has organized here. It's been a, a, a great conference. And uh, I mean, we will do our best. Uh, so um, yeah, uh, Barcelona is a Mediterranean city. It's uh, located in uh, western basin of, uh, well, of Mediterranean Sea and, uh, in Europe. And it was formed by Romans in the first century before Christ. So yeah lot of um, history behind us. Well, from this first century to now, we have growing up. We are almost two million people living in this uh, spot here. And we like to say that Barcelona is an easy city because you never can get lost there. You have a mountain, two rivers, and the Mediterranean Sea. And then if you walk, walk or you are wandering around and you're walking to and find a river, you storm back and you will return to the city center. It's, it's an, an easy city for us. And this is the landscape from this natural park that is uh, behind Barcelona. So as, as mentioned before, um, it's more than 2,000 years of history, and you can find this in every corner uh, of, the, of the old town in the city. Like, for example, here you see the um, Santa Maria del Mar, uh, which was built during the mediev medieval golden age, that uh, when Barcelona was um, the maritime trade of, of Europe. Uh, and, and also, if you have ridden this uh, famous view, um, the Cathedral of the Sea, it's based on, on this church. Uh, also, you, um, you can, well, a lot of buildings, and another famous one is the cathedral. So if you want to take a picture like this, you will have to be there like early in the morning, because otherwise there plen plenty of stories, but um, well, a, a lot of places to, to see. Yes, uh, well, as uh, we are also the Catalonia by itself, but also Barcelona is the cradle of the Catalan modernism. That this is an art movement uh, led by Antoni Gaudí, and there is a lot of buildings all around Barcelona. Uh, even we have this big temple, the, 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 the Holy Family, Sagrada Familia, started in 1882, it's in the 19th century. And when you arrive there, it doesn't mind the, take, the time you take the picture, these cranes will be there until 2029. Uh, but it, what is true is that uh, all, the, all the city is full of different spots of this modernism art, and even you can go to Joan Miro uh, Museum or, or to Pablo Picasso Museum that is in the same place. And, and, and also we have like a strong and deep um, cultural heritage, like um, so uh, world wild famous uh, human towers that are not just um, nice because it's, it's uh, technical complexity, but also because it's beauty. And if you don't like heights, we have the, 
Yes, this is the most amazing, fun, and technically complicated dance in the world. It's called La Sardana. And then you stay there in any Sunday, in any place, or in any square of uh, any town in Barcelona, uh, in, in the Catalonia or in Barcelona, even in the cathedral square. You can see how the people uh, dance. This, this is the only ring we have there. And we, can, we, can, we will enjoy you to, 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 to join them uh, to understand how this, is, how this dance is, is, is danced. Uh, Going to the to the venue, uh, well, as Carla said, we are open to the Mediterranean. We are not so many marine mammals as you have just here in your Atlantic uh, area, but we are monitoring some bottlenose dolphins and some uh, research dolphins in the area. And the venue will be held in a flourishing area of Barcelona. It's called the, the Forum, and you can explain what is the venue. Yeah. So um, the venue is yeah located in front of the sea. Uh, it's called the International Convention Center of Catalonia. It has capacity for more than uh, 15,000 uh, people, and uh, also it has uh, space uh, and rooms for the concurrent sessions. And um, and also uh, there is a place for the plenary uh, session, the auditorium, and I uh, think. We think that it's uh, quite suitable for uh, hosting the next uh, conference in Barcelona. Uh, just to finish, we want to share a uh, one-minute video for, with some measures of, of the city and the neighborhood that are all the places you can visit in one hour from Barcelona. Thank you. We, we were not lying. We have a nice city and a, a, a best country. And we encourage you to, to meet there in, in, in Barcelona in December on 2019. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. I'm sold. I don't know about you. Another reason to renew your membership. <laughs> Anna's got an exciting announcement to make with regard to 2021. Well, I think we couldn't be more fortunate. We are here in 2017 um, celebrating the end of a wonderful conference. We know where we're going in 2019, and that's Barcelona. Um, we are very fortunate to have a proposal for where we will be going in 2021. And to introduce that proposal, we will ask um, Dr. Amy Hirons and Dr. Steve Trumbull to come up, and they are going to be coming up with an army of graduate students from Nova Southeastern University. Amy and Steve. Good afternoon. Uh, as Anna said, we have put forth a proposal and are suggesting to the membership that we hold the 24th Biennial Conference in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Uh, what we have proposed is the dates of uh, workshops the first weekend, December 11th and 12th, with the following week. Uh, the location would be right on the intercoastal waterway, which also then connects very readily to the Atlantic Ocean uh, at the Fort Lauderdale Convention Center and hosted by Nova Southeastern University. 
as Anna has pointed out, that right now, um, myself, conference chair, Dr. Steve Tremble from Baylor University, scientific program chair, We've also introduced uh, diversity chairs, and in such, we've got Jeremy Kiska and Louisa Panampalam from Malaysia. Our theme is global change, global diversity. We hope that meets well with the membership here. Also, you'll note at the bottom, uh, the building itself, for those of you who know, is uh, lead construction, but basically sustainable construction. Recycling is very important in this part of the world, as I'm sure it is with all of us, so we're proposing to refer to this conference as the Blue-Green Conference. Uh, Fort Lauderdale has an international airport, has a multitude of uh, terminals. It has many direct and non-stop flights from every continent on the world, except Antarctica. I'm sure they're working on that. Okay. Uh, if you look at the slide here, the airport is located in easy just over three miles from uh, the convention center, our location proposed here on the intracoastal. Should it be easier for our membership and other participants to fly into Miami International Airport? It is only 20 miles down the road or approximately a $30 Uber, um, which we also have Uber, Lyft, shuttles, taxis, trains. So transportation is readily accessible and relatively cheap. Did I skip one? Okay. Um, the upper slide is the Fort Lauderdale Convention Center. It is all glass. It is about 30,000 square feet. It will easily accommodate our entire membership plus it has a multitude of rooms, large spaces for our plenary sessions, our poster sessions, and easy accessibility. Directly across the intercoastal is Nova South Eastern University's Oceanographic Center, where we would expect to have a number of events that would take place during the week. We have a multitude of local hotels at many price points that should be available and easily accessible for those of us who with uh, lower financial resources and those with much more readily accessible resources. All of these can be within several hundred feet to less than one mile from the convention center as a proposed site. There's a multitude of local attractions. We have great natural resources, including readily access to the Everglades, including Everglades National Park and Biscayne Bay National Park, as well as a variety of zoos uh, and other attractions. On top of that, because we are very aquatically oriented, Fort Lauderdale has the largest coastline of any other city, town, or provinciality within the state. So you can take a break when you are world weary or weary from listening to all of the excellent talks uh, and go underwater, get by yourself, uh, and enjoy perhaps the uh, warm sunny weather. One thing I didn't add here is a UV ray index, which we are generally nine to 10 on that scale. So sunscreen packet, very important. Very little rainfall. We are out of hurricane season, folks, this time of the year. Uh, and it is quite lovely. Additionally, because the conference is proposed to end approximately a week before the major holidays begin, you might choose to bring your family, your friends, etc. So we are very close ready access to Miami Beach, the Florida Keys. You may choose to take a cruise to Bahamas or the Caribbean, or perhaps visit those well-known theme parks in Orlando. So as we've mentioned, and we all know, undertaking a conference is a huge task, and I don't even profess to know everything that is going to be involved in this. So we're looking to you, you know, to help us bring your expertise, bring your love, bring your skills. These graduate students here have, you know, they may or may not still be there, but they represent a small contingent of the force that is going to be needed. So please, we encourage you, contact us. We'll be open. Thank you.
Ouch. Thank you, Amy. Um, can we go back one slide? Uh, yeah, so at this point, um, we typically vote among possible venues for our um, conference four years out. We have exactly one proposal uh, before you right now, but in case someone in the audience wants to run up to a microphone, start running now, there is an opportunity if, if there is another party in the audience that would like to propose a site, we can provide time for you to develop a proposal and we'll have a vote by, by email or a web-based vote. I'm, where, where are they all? <laughs> um, okay. Um, I think then that... You know yeah. that I won't be yeah, offering yeah, yeah, thank an, you. Uh, an alternative... Back to New Zealand. Because we've been there, done that. Uh, but I have a question that just might prompt somebody else to make a proposal. And that is, um, uh, I wonder if there are any universities that might be interested to make a proposal, not necessarily for 2021, perhaps for the one following and the one following that, um, uh, in terms of cost, that should be a lot more favourable. And of course, um, some countries will be teaching at the time of year that we traditionally have our conference, but there may be other parts of the world where there's a whole university sitting empty that could be used for a conference. And yeah, I think that, that worked very well in the case of New Zealand, and I encourage um, anyone making a proposal for, for future conferences do that. But at this point, we've yeah. beat the bushes. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the members at large and Anne have done an outstanding job um, in securing a proposal for us. For sure, yeah. yeah. Maybe the Australians? Come on, Australians. <laughs> Um, at this point, um, I would like to call for um, an unofficial vote of affirmation um, for um, the having a conference in Fort Lauderdale, following up on that wonderful presentation and offer by Amy and her group. All in favor? Hmm? Keep your hands up. Okay. Opposed? No one wants to step forward and no one's opposing. I think we can uh, accept the offer. What? Offer we have on the table. Thank you very much. Uh, next on the agenda is the treasurer's report and Tim Reagan will be presenting. Good afternoon, I'm gonna to try to give you just a general idea of our fiscal resources, what we have, and then how we use them. I've got three slides. Okay, the first slide that you see up there, the blue line is the trend in our total assets over time. I'm projecting that at the end of this fiscal year, or at the end of this calendar year, there'll be about $1.64 million. The line or the distance between the red line below, which are investments, and the blue line is actually cash on hand, which we use to operate during the course of the year. The investments that we have as of the end of September totaled about $1.436 million, but they are actually split into two parts. Um, below you see a couple of green dots. Those are the totals for endowments that are used for awards. Those are not funds that are readily or accessible to the society to use for other purposes. The distance above those green dots to the red are, are the monies that the society itself has uh, to use for its purposes. Okay, so our investments are broken down into three general categories. One is fixed income at about 13%, one is money market funds at about 29%, and one is equities at about 58%. Those all together are roughly the 40 to 60 low to moderate risk ratio that we have been seeking as part of our investment strategy. 
Over the last year, the total amounts have increased about 6%, but a portion of that was due to a very generous uh, contribution by the Herman family for the Lewis Herman uh, Research Scholarship. In addition, this year we did a quick uh, assessment of all of the 30 different funds that we have in our investment portfolio uh, to see how they stack up against green criteria or sustainability criteria. And for those of you who work with investments, you may recognize the name Morningstar. Morningstar uh, review, they're an independent firm that reviews and describes how various forms are performing and they have a sustainability rating that looks at how a portfolio is managed in terms of its uh, environmental, uh, social and governance responsibilities and opportunities. They rank one from five and when you take a weighted mean of all of our investment funds or the ones that have been ranked, which is most of them, um, our overall ranking is 3.9 out of five for the sustainability rating. We are right now looking at several of those funds to see if they haven't come up high enough that we want to keep them in the portfolio. But that's, for those of you who are strongly interested in that criteria, that gives you an idea of where we fall. This is my last slide and I want to give you an idea again both of how to compare our expenses during the course of the year uh, with our revenue and also how to see our expenses differ, our revenue and expenses differ during the course of a conference year 2017 and a non-conference year 2018. And I've broken this down into several categories just to give you a ballpark of what they cost us. Administration is things like uh, postage, uh, bank fees, PayPal fees, et cetera, and those are roughly uh, about 3,200, 3,300. They're fairly small. Support contracts are things like investment management, insurance, um, tax preparation. They'll be a little bit less in 2018 because we don't have to have insurance. We buy a special insurance policy when we hold these conferences. Um, Website management will also drop down because it's a much less intense year than this one has been. Uh, grants and aid will actually be fairly, will be constant um, year to year. We have an audit due next year. Every six years the society calls for an audit on its books and 2018 is that year. So I'm hoping that we can keep it within about a $15,000 limit. Every year in a non-conference year, we allocate about $40,000 to start the planning process for the Barcelona meeting in this case, and so that will be on the books. Our board activities also, we have a board meeting and there are things that come up during the course of the year that require board, especially travel. And so I bumped that up this year because we, it will be a little bit more expensive to do travel to Barcelona. Journal editing is fairly constant. Uh, our editors for the journal, uh, we spend about uh, 71, 72,000 for that. There's a small uh, increase for uh, inflation yearly. Our journal uh, publications are roughly about 80,000 a year. The next item is our conference and I'll draw your attention to the expenses for that about 750,000 or three quarters of a million dollar. Keep that figure in mind and in a minute I'll refer back to it. Um, we also will have a little bit of a conference expense uh, for 2018 in that the uh, programming and all of the background work that uh, our different program team put into it is gonna cost a little bit more because there's a little bit of refinement and building out necessarily uh, necessary for the next conference. So our total uh, in 2017, in terms of expenses, was about a million. Um, in 2018, the total will be about 332,000 in expenses. That's more than usual, in part because of some of these different activities. Our revenue is from interest in our investment, and here I've included only investment from the SMM's monies, not the endowments. We have membership, and note that in 2017, a conference year, it's about $105,000. Next year, we're projecting about $50,000. We're concerned about the big difference between those and trying to figure out what we can do about that. So that's a topic that, um, and one of the reasons that Jay is emphasizing, and we're all emphasizing the value of your membership. 
our Wiley editorial support. They actually give us some money to help us with editing, um, and that is on a set increase. So this year it'll be about 57, or next year it'll be about $57,000. They also give us some royalties, 20% of what they earn in a given year. So that's a form of income for us. And now here's that conference revenue, which compared to the 750,000 I spoke about just a minute ago, it's just a little bit over 900,000 if our best estimates are correct right now. And I, I suspect they're quite good because the team, the conference team has just done a superb job of keeping track of what they're doing and managing their, their resources and their expenses. And that extra money, as I'll show you in a second, is really pretty critical to the way we operate through the course of the year. Um, if you subtract the revenue minus the expense, uh, we should end uh, in 2017 with about 115000 um, add to that money we brought into 2017 from the preceding year, and we end up with on the left at the very bottom a total of about $154,000. If you look on the right in 2018 and subtract the, uh, the revenue from the expense, you can see that we'll be in the hole about $156,000. Uh, but if you then combine what we carry over from this year, again, thank you, conference people, um, that will bring us very close to parity. Um, the amount that's left there is, I would say, is noise. Uh, overall, again, I think it, this should draw your attention to the Im important differences between the years, the great value that there is in the conference people doing such a great job of organizing, and how important the conference is to the uh, sort of fiscal health of the society. So that's all I have. If you feel free to grab me uh, after this, if you want to have specific questions. Uh, thank you, Tim. The next is the uh, Marine Mammal Science Editor's Report by Daryl Benes. Okay, thank you. If we can have the next slide, maybe I control. No, I guess. There we go. Okay, actually, um, I've been editor now for 10 years um, of marine mammal science. Um, I was going to, uh, you see these first few bullets, I'm going to actually just skip over because looking at the uh, remaining audience after Randy's talk, um, this was geared toward the younger audience who maybe hadn't, hasn't published in marine mammal science yet, but uh, clearly most people here probably have. Um, I'll skip right down to the bottom couple of bullets. One has to do with reviewers. Um, the society, and I don't think we're unique in this regard, I think many other journals have this problem, are finding it harder and harder to get reviewers in a timely fashion. Um, this past year, I actually had an experience where I almost had to reject a paper without review because I couldn't get reviewers. Um, we had a paper that took over 20 potential reviewers um, before we found two who would review for the journal for this particular paper. And it took um, 250 days to go through the review process because of the delay getting reviewers. So I really uh, um, ask you all when asked to review, um, and I know you're all busy, but um, please, please, um, continue reviewing and sometimes you'll have to review more than once. Um, uh, it's really important for us to be timely if we can and it's so dependent on uh, reviewers being um, willing. The other thing I'd ask um, of our membership is that uh, the society has a standing taxonomic committee um, we have uh, from that committee uh, a taxonomic list that is up updated every year. The journal requires that all papers follow the taxonomic uh, list. Um, so it's a whole lot easier if we don't have to um, check every one of these papers to make sure that people are following it. But also I encourage you in publishing in other journals that you uh, use our taxonomic list. So let me then just quickly give you some metrics about our journal. Um, 
uh, we're pretty consistent in the number of original papers we receive each year. Uh, this past year, we had 193 papers um, submitted from 32 countries. We typically are somewhere in the mid to high 30s um, in the number of countries. So we are, in fact, truly representing um, a, an international community. Um, our time from submission is staying fairly consistent, somewhere in that 60 to 70 day range. Um, our acceptance rate is up a little bit. Uh, we've been in the range of 45 um, percent, a little bit lower, a little bit higher. We're at 50 percent this past year. Um, our impact ratio is uh, essentially the same as it was last year. In the 10 years I've been editor, the highest impact ratio we've had, uh, impact factor we've had is, is 2, 2.1, I believe. Um, but we, again, tend to be in that range of somewhere between 1.4 and, and that 2.1 uh, as a high. Um, if I were to, and in, in, our, in the, my full report, which will ultimately be on the line, you'll see a little bit broader comparison with other society journals. We actually fall um, pretty consistently in the middle, a little bit on the high side of the middle of where we are with an impact factor for a society journal. Um, I don't think our journal will ever achieve um, you know, a, a high impact factor compared to um, uh, non-society based journals. And similarly, our ranking um, in zoology related journals and in marine related journals are stay is staying fairly um, uh, similar from year to year over the past decade. So I'd be happy to answer any questions after this um, if anybody has them about the journal and feel free to email if you have any questions or or concerns about the way the journal is, is going. Thank you much. Thank you, Daryl. The next order of business, if we return to our roadmap, is the committee reports. Um, if I could ask the, um, the members of our, the chairs of our committees to stand up front, um, well, they can deliver the report. You can look at the monitors to your right or your left as you're uh, as you're making your presentation, and there's a pass around mic up front there. Um, not all committees are reporting, but the first will be membership committee. Chris? Yeah, so we don't have the time delay. Can everybody move up uh, so that you're uh, ready to take the microphone next? So as you can see, the largest section of the membership is full members. Um, we have a significant component of student membership, however, well more than a quarter of the membership in total. If you look at the gender breakup of the membership, as you can see, the student membership is overwhelmingly female. As you go to uh, I guess sort of older levels of membership, such as honorary membership, emeritus membership, that gender ratio shifts quite dramatically. And as you can see here, uh, we don't actually record the gender of members when we take membership, so we actually had to go through all 1,540 member details and work out what people's gender was based on their names. So if you're called Kelly or Leslie, you're very frustrating because we don't know where to allocate you. So some of the genders are unidentified. Uh, we've provided this information for the Women in Science workshop, which is tomorrow. Um, as you can see as well, we do have developing country members, but the proportion is unfortunately really rather low. And this gives you an idea of the membership in total. We do have a lot of members from across the world, but membership is very much dominated by North American members, with the USA being by far the largest section of the membership, followed by Canada, UK, Australia, Brazil, 
is uh, also got quite a substantial membership. Thank you, D Doug. I want to be sure uh, <clears throat> you all had a chance to see the uh, members of the Scientific uh, Advisory Committee because they worked very hard in evaluating the proposals of the um, s students and young investigators from uh, developing countries. And they not only evaluate the proposals, but they also provide very valuable feedback to the uh, proposal submitters so that whether they actually get funded or not, it's a very valuable experience for uh, the um, young investigators around the world who have submitted their proposals. The um, Board of Governors recognized the importance of this uh, exercise and this benefit of membership in the society for our young investigators from around the world, and they uh, reflected that in doubling the amount of money that was available for this uh, program, and also we increased the um, um, dollar amount that an individual investigator could, uh, could receive. The, uh, this, this past year, we had uh, 29 proposals, um, and uh, as I said, each of those committee members and each of them evaluated probably about a dozen uh, total proposals because each proposal was evaluated by three reviewers. The scores ranged from um, the ones that were funded from um, the 49 to 59. Uh, and one of the things, the, the, the ones that weren't funded um, were, fair, were, were lower scores, but I think the point is that we really did have an outstanding collection of uh, proposals submitted. We do provide on the um, website um, proposals from previous years so that uh, people who are thinking about submitting can go on the web and look at the most successful proposals from recent years and uh, I would encourage the entire membership to go on the web and look at the reports that the students uh, and young investigators submit after they've completed their projects, and you'll see the quality of work that the society is uh, sponsoring ar around the world. And that this just uh, provides a um, overview of the countries from which we uh, receive proposals and the countries from which they were awarded. Um, some of them are, are, are uh, typical, but uh, I will note that this is the first year we uh, were able to award a research proposal in Nepal and also the first year that we awarded one in Cuba. Thank you. If you could hand those to Laura, I think she's up next. Thank you, Jay. Sarah, Courtney, okay. Thanks for coming. I hope you've enjoyed the conference. We are your student members at large. My name is Laura Fire. This is Sarah Keenley and Courtney Smith. Uh, Sarah is actually sadly leaving us after this board meeting. And Courtney and I will continue for the next couple of years. Not myself. I think I'm rotating off in this summer. I was here for this conference. I'm local. So that's why they got me. <laughs> uh, yes, this is us. We were really pumped to do this conference. And this is us at the beginning. We're looking maybe slightly more tired now. <laughs> oh, sorry. Here we up. So some of the highlights, we had a great networking night. We kind of shifted the uh, format a little bit. Uh, we would encourage uh, maybe some more formal student workshops to happen during the workshops. But that's, it's different every year, and I think that's part of the fun of it. Uh, we were able to award travel grants to all student presenters. That was pretty exciting to be able to do that. Um, and every year it's a little bit different depending on location and how many student applications, but essentially we had, what was it, 325 students that received travel awards. So, and maybe a little bit more than that. I really want to acknowledge uh, Hillary and Tanya for their support in making that possible and fundraising their buns off. <laughs> Literally, we did a race. <laughs> Uh, so if you're a part of the Facebook group, you may have known that. And thank you to everybody who donated through the GoFundMe for that race. That was really fun and sweaty. We have uh, 3,535 Facebook members. If you're not a member of the student Facebook, you can just ask to join. And as long as you didn't become a Facebook member yesterday from Russia, 
um, then, no, I'm kidding. We probably would still accept you, but uh, it might take a few days. So that's one of the things that we do as well, is monitor the Facebook site. Uh, this is our student booth. This was Courtney's awesome idea. <laughs> Thank you, Courtney. And I think I'm gonna pass it over to you just to mention a little bit about the student chapters. Yeah, so we have um, eight active student chapters. And most importantly, this week, I've been in touch with several students from around the world. We've got um, the New England chapter, which kind of fell to the wayside, is being reorganized. So thank you, students, for being excited about that. Um, Way Cool is uh, potential student chapters in Asia and the Mediterranean. So really embracing that global membership and capacity building from the ground up. If you're interested in joining us, making a student chapter, get in touch with us. The more, the merrier. <laughs> Great. And just one more big thank you to our mentors who came to student night. You are all very special, and we really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paul, could you come forward? Um, I can oh, thank you very much speak to you from the ethics committee you can see that our <clears throat> our membership and our uh, primary uh, task during this past year was to uh, create the code of conduct and work on a harassment free policy regarding sexual harassment primarily for our society and our meetings I'm sure that you saw our code of conduct within the uh, papers for the for the meeting and also, uh, we, are, we created, working with the board, created the harassment-free policy. It's undergoing a last review and will be available soon. Uh, we're also working on other topics uh, as well, but in the instance of time, I'll just uh, end it with that. Thank you. Lindsay. Hi there, everyone. I'm Lindsay Porter, the chair of the of the Awards and Scholarships Committee. Um, most of our committee's activities this year and last year have been uh, focusing on preparing for the awards here at the conference, which you'll hear more of later. Um, I would, and I'll be announcing those um, at the next at the ceremony. What I wanted to draw your attention to, in early 2018, we will be making a call for proposals for three different awards, which we run in the interconference years. The Emily B. Shane Award for US dollars 10,000, which is for conservation proposals on free-ranging cetaceans and serenians. The Louis M. Herman Scholarship Fund, which was announced at our opening ceremony, will also put a call out, uh, particularly focusing on those research activities that Lewis Herman uh, was interested in. And finally, the John Heining Award, which is for a comparative physiology uh, proposal. Uh, all of these will be posted on the website, on all the social media, and on Marman. And if you have any questions pertaining to these particular awards, please contact me and please, I do encourage you all to apply for these proposals. Thank you. And, and I encourage you all to stay for the award ceremony. It's going to be great. Um, I'm going to, if you bring, bring me the buzzer back, I'm gonna do international affairs. Um, Giuseppe was not able to be here. He has a relatively large committee and a very large task. So his committee reviews requests for travel grants to these meetings, um, and they don't just let, you know, they, they don't just let money out the door. They actually um, review each of the, the, the abstracts um, from those that are accepted at the meeting, and then they choose um, in this case, 26 colleagues from 14 low-income com co countries to come to this conference. Um, that's fantastic. Uh, the, we, we, it was a 
Um, we have $40,000 allocated to that this year, and uh, Giuseppe was very good at spending every penny. In addition, uh, it's kind of intimidating to come to a meeting like this, an enormous gar gargantuan meeting, if you haven't done this before. So he, the, uh, the committee hosted a welcoming party for the grantees to make them feel um, a little bit more welcome and to give them a little introduction to, to what, this, with, what this society and what this meeting would be all about. Finally, I want to mention that we, ha we are seeking members um, from Africa for this committee. It's underrepresented right now, and uh, if, you know, if you are or know of anyone who might be interested in serving on this committee, uh, please contact us. Also, if you're a student and would be interested in serving on any of the committees that I've mentioned, um, please contact the, the board. Um, we, we're always looking for student members because those are the ones that we, we cycle off the boards. They actually graduate, <laughs> yay. <laughs> and so we're always, always in, in search for uh, more student members to our, our board. And each of our boards have, has a position for a, a student on it. Uh, next, I'll ask Katerina to come forward and talk about the website. Katerina, by the way, is much more than, than just our webmaster. She, we've, uh, in recognition of this, we've given her a new title. She's our information and technology manager. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, so this year I want to say hello. It's nice to see all of you and uh, tell you about uh, some new things that we made and some things you don't know about on our website. We've, uh, so visit marinemammalscience.org if you haven't recently. We have these beautiful new fact sheets and we've been working hard with uh, the education committee to make sure that they're accurate and up to date and they have gorgeous illustrations. We have a member directory that we encourage you to use. So if you're ever looking for somebody you, and you're a member, you can go online and find the most recent contact information for anybody who's a member. Uh, so that's a great resource. As Lindsay's been working to build out and make more robust our awards program, there are grant and award opportunities that come up through the year, and so there's funding opportunities. So keep up with that. Daryl's been doing a great job featuring journal articles on a regular basis, and so when you go to the website, you can see what are some of the most interesting featured journal articles to click through to. Uh, we have a job submission board. This has long been a very popular feature on our, on our website, and now you can directly submit jobs to the website, and the student members at large do a great job of keeping it up to date, so that's a great resource for both posting and for looking for new jobs. Um, and yes, the taxonomy list, we continue to keep that updated through the year, so I encourage you to continue to use the website as a resource. And that uh, speaks to my big goal is, my real interest here is how to use the tools we have, our website, our social media, to serve the mission of the society, and that's why I have it up here. That's what we think about all the time as a board, is this mission, and what can we do using the website and using our social media tools and communication and resources to serve this mission. And the board is, really wants to know what you think. They want you to participate. They want you to talk. They want an active membership. And so I'm uh, very happy that you, our Facebook has been growing. We're at 9,000 and more people. And uh, if you send us messages, we write back to you that way. Work on Twitter, if that's how you like talking to us, send me an email. I'm at admin at marinemammalscience.org, members at marinemammalscience.org, uh, so talk to us. And Chris didn't mention, but we've got this survey coming out because we want to know who you are, and we want to know how we can serve the membership best. So my biggest request is to please communicate with us about what we can do to help you be better scientists and educators and conservationists, so thank you. Thank you, Katerina. I don't know if you were tallying those numbers, but there was 90,000 given to students to travel to this conference, 40,000 to foreign visitor, uh, foreign investigators to travel to this con conference, and 30,000 for small grants to, uh, to, de um, to developing countries. That's $150,000 going out 
the door from this society um, to do good. And uh, if you're wondering what the society does, that's a lot of what we do. We're only able to do this because of sponsorship. This does not come out of your membership dues. Um, we have some very generous sponsors for this uh, conference, and uh, I think we can just take a moment to thank all of those for those funding. At this point, I seek um, a motion to accept the treasurers and um, editors and committee members' reports. Uh, Bruce Mates seconds. All in favor? All opposed? Okay, unanimous. Thank you very much. We have a little bit of new business. I know we're running late, so I'm going to run through this as quickly as I can. You'll be asked to vote on new governing documents, boring stuff. You have to vote. Um, next is the very important subject of nominations um, for the offices. Um, at, this, at this time, um, many of the, the people you see in, in front of you will be ro uh, rotating off the, off the board. I'm retiring. Um, uh, Tim Reagan is stepping down. Um, we will be losing um, two um, members at, student members at large, and we'll be losing uh, Lorenzo Rojas as uh, our member at large. So we need to fill those positions. And uh, Emer, our uh, chair of our elections and uh, nominations committee, has uh, been searching high and low for the right candidates. And these are her committee members. I would like to start off just by saying thank you to the committee members who work hard to try and um, find candidates to stand for election. And as Jay said, there are a number of positions available. Um, I'd also like to thank all the people who um, considered standing, and I'm really grateful to those people who have considered having their names put forward for election. And I also want to um, say that, of course, this is your opportunity to stand for um, election if you want to do that as well. The ballot will be in May, and um, the other thing I would really like to do is encourage you all to vote, because actually voting often tends, numbers tend to be quite low. And finally, I'd just like to thank Katerina, who does an amazing job with the um, the online voting. Okay, so the positions, um, we are, um, we have two people who have agreed to stand for um, president-elect, which you know is, is a four-year commitment, two years as president-at-large, or sorry, two years as president-elect, who serves with Anne, and then two years um, as the president. And so those two people that um, have agreed to stand for president-elect are Charles Nittman and Simona Panagada. Um, I guess at this stage, we will take Okay, okay, we didn't rehearse this. Okay, so after that then, um, we'd like to um, put one fo person forward as secretary, uh, Tara Cox. Um, as treasurer, two people have very kindly agreed to um, stand, uh, Katie Moore and Lori Shuwaki. Um, the two people who have agreed to stand as member at large are Per Bergen and Cecile Vincent. And finally, we have uh, Two proposals for student members at large, Raquel uh, Garcia Bernat and Diego Rito Espada. Thank you, Emer, um, and your committee for, for that good work uh, to bring forward such an outstanding slate of, uh, of candidates. Um, at this point, I would like to take nominations from the floor for any of these elected officers. Um, offices. Um, if you are interested, um, please um, move to a microphone. Um, say which of these offices you're nominating for, um, the name that you're nominating, um, and their affiliation if you'd, if you'd like to add that. Um, this um, gives also at the bottom the eligibility requirements. All of these um, positions need to be members at the time of nomination, so members now, and uh, as the student members at large obviously have to be students, uh, either student members or full members, and enrolled in graduate school. Thank you. Um, I see
Courtney. <laughs> yes, I nominate Eric Ramos from City University of New York for student member at large. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to nominate Alan uh, D. Allen for the treasurer position. Um, and your name? Diego Rita. Thank you. Are there any nomina more nominations from the floor? Nominations are closed. You'll have a, whoop. Okay, nominations are closed. You'll have an opportunity to vote for um, these members um, at, in the May ballot and you'll have um, a little um, paragraph from each of them describing what their, what their interests are and what they want to uh, do as new members of the board. Okay, we're still on new business. Um, we, we will, um, Katarina fortunately covered this already. Um, please fill out uh, the membership survey when it comes to you early in 2018. Um, one of the things I promised um, when I took um, this podium two years ago was to um, help develop a conservation fund for the society. Um, we've made a lot of progress on that in the last year. We have a nice color brochure that uh, uh, Doug Ortsog uh, and his development shop have been able to uh, produce for us. Um, if I will talk to that shortly. The theme here is preventing the next ex extinction. Um, as Randy pointed out, we are in desperate situations with many of the marine mammals we study, and how could we study them if they're gone? Um, the goal is to raise um, funds for research and education projects that have the highest chance at catalyzing real action. We recognize that not all research um, has that goal, but if that is your goal, we're looking for you as participants. Um, the grants will, we hope to uh, award between three hundred and five hundred thousand dollars in grants on a two-year cycle, uh, and then each individual grants would be on the order of uh, uh, ten thousand to a hundred thousand dollars. To do this, we have a strategy to um, raise funds and establish a self-perpetuating endowment of approximately five million dollars. That's a lot of money to most people. It's very, very little money to some people, and we need to find those people. The, the fund will be managed by the treasurer, sem separate from uh, uh, general funds, um, invested a little bit more aggressively so that we have those rates of return that we need to fund projects. Um, proposals will be solicited biennially, reviewed by both the committees of scientific advisors and the conservation committee. We've made some progress. Um, we have the management as proposal written. Um, we have five example projects um, that I reached out to various members of the society. And so we have projects on, on finless porpoise in China and uh, the, uh, the Taiwanese um, Susa and uh, Caspian seals, so some of the highest priorities projects. Um, we have the brochure drafted, and we have now collected pledges of 628,000, um, all from so society members. So we got a good start. However, to get off the ground, we need 1.5 million uh, to establish this fund. We've set, the society set that, the board set that as, as the minimum requirement um, to make the, the administration of all this worthwhile. So we need help. Um, we need contact information for uh, generous donors. Um, we need help raising these funds. We need you. Well, how can you help? Well, one, one obvious way is with what's euphemistically called legacy funds. You 
are not going to live forever, I'm sure, all of you. Um, but it, what if you are anyway, what harm would there be in naming the Society for Marine Mammalogy Conser Conservation Fund um, as your beneficiary in your will, living trust, or simply as a beneficiary on a, on, uh, a transfer on death account? So there's lots that, that you can do. But why wait? <laughs> I, I don't want to be standing by you like some sort of old world vulture. Many of you, and, and I'm not talking about the, the younger students, but many of your, the senior people here have at least $100,000 more than they will ever use in their retirement. And what are you going to do? Buy a boat and burn carbon? No. You're going to contribute to this fund. I really, I'm, I'm really serious. The, you know, the, the donations that we've gotten so far have come from members um, that, that, that recognized they wanted to give back to the society that they have belonged to for all of their life and, and which is giving so much to save these animals. So it's about time you give back to the animals. Um, we need to do more and we need to do it earlier, as, as Randy said. We can't afford to wait till the next marine mammal species drops below 30 individuals. People in this room have either the resources or the connections to make it happen, so let's do it. I have a limited number of copies of our brochure. If you are a potential contributor or if you know someone, you got a rich aunt, you got you, any, and if you think that this would be helpful to the society, please take it. We can always print more. Um, but don't take it just if you're, you're interested. You can always email me, you can get a copy of the proposal, and you can get a PDF of this uh, brochure as well. Yes. Yeah, for those of who are intimidated about not having the boat for their last few years, um, go ahead and buy the boat if you must, but name the society in your estate plan because your executor will liquidate your assets. And a lot of people don't want to give up their assets before they know how much they're going to need to finish out the rest of this world. Uh, if you want to feel good in the next world, put it into your estate plan so that it's dedicated after you no longer have need of it and it's not so intimidating to worry about not getting your boat. Thank you, and uh, I know that uh, Bruce lives by his words, and, and so do I. Oh. The next general meet, bus, new business meeting is you. We, this is your opportunity to bring new business uh, to the floor. Um, looks like Andrew. Hello. Um, I, I uh, want to... Um, congratulate the board and the society for all the money they've put into bringing developing nations people and, and uh, students to the meeting however it's clear from the membership uh, spectrum that uh, Chris put up uh, that there's still a little bit more work to be done so uh, I would like to um, propose that the society works to uh, set up a new diversity committee and and given the thoughts of Asher DeVos and the efforts uh, that is going to come from the workshop tomorrow from Francis Robertson and others, I would actually suggest they co-lead that sort of uh, um, um, small committee to set that, that more uh, long-term thing up. So. Thank you. That was a comment made at the board meeting as well, and I, I think the board is, will take that into advice, but I think that's a very good idea. If there's no n more new business from the floor, um, I'm going to take just a minute uh, to give my, my thanks and, and farewell here. Um, first, thank you to Tanya and Hillary and everyone involved with this conference. Sophie, Damien, um, the AV professionals, let's, let's have a big hand for all of them. Um, I know that, uh, that Hillary and Tanya have a long list of, of thank yous as well, so I won't, won't project that again but in sake of time, but uh, um, it, it takes 
I don't like to say, say it takes an army because that's too militaristic, but, and, and Hillary said it takes a village, but that, that's, <clears throat> that, that's used. I don't know what it takes. It takes a pod. Okay, thank you. Um, we have some um, officers and, um, and other members who are stepping down from uh, posts of authority in the society. I want to thank uh, Tim Reagan for his service as, as treasurer. And I'd like to thank our, our members at, at large, Sarah and Laura and, uh, and um, Lorenzo. Thank you. <laughs> and finally, um, I want to comment on, on, on what a great conference it's been. Um, there, I've, I've loved every aspect of it. Um, thank you, Damien, for bringing us the, the video presentations. I think they'll be a big hit, and I think that they'll, they'll only grow in importance in future conferences, and it's great to experiment with new things. And I, I'm just amazed at the high quality of the poster presentations and, and the talks that I've had with the posters, pre presenters. They were, you know, they're obviously very thoughtful people, but, you know, I felt like I got to know them a little bit uh, by talking the, directly with them, and I, I, I thank you for the for, for doing that and taking the time to talk to me. And finally, I wish Ann Pabst, your new president, all, all the best. I, I know that I'm handing this society off to her, uh, the, the best of people. I know that we're running late, but um, I would like uh, Anne to have a chance to say a few words, and then we're going to hear uh, final words from uh, the conference committee. Thank you, Jay, very much. Um, I have just a few brief but important things to share with you. Um, first, and, and actually very sadly, I must tell you that at this meeting we learned of two more colleagues whom we have lost since our last biennial. Michelle Morris and Richard Ternulo. Um, Jared Cork and I will be, um, will be amending the in memoriam that you all saw earlier this week, and we'll post the revised presentation on our website uh, after the meeting to honor all of our colleagues. And second, I'm going to go ahead and do just exactly what Jay did, uh, just did. I would like to take just one more moment to thank all of the folks who are stepping off of the committee um, and our board. Sarah Keenly, Lorenzo Rojas Bracco, Tim Reagan, um, and Jay Barlow. I have watched how each of these individuals have worked uh, over the past uh, two years, and um, they've worked every day on behalf of the society. So if we could take just one more moment to thank them, I'd like us to do that. Um, then if you'll permit me, I would like to take just a few minutes um, to talk uh, with you um, and reflect upon our society as we look forward to the future. And as I reached out to colleagues and friends um, to think about that future, there was a word that kept coming up in all of these discussions. And that word was community. Um, we have a feeling of fellowship because we share common interests and goals. And importantly, we all also own our society. It is our community. And, and what other community gets a chance to sit in a hockey rink while listening to scientific presentations? I mean, that doesn't get any better. Um, and we tell our stories, our scientific stories. And I have to tell you that we tell really good scientific stories. And these stories are often told by our newest and our youngest members. Now, why do we tell these stories? because we all, each and every one of us, cares very much about the quality of the work that we do, its creativity, its innovation, and its impact. And these lead us to discoveries about the organisms that are at the heart of our community. And those, of course, are marine mammals. We care about these organisms. We care about their environment. Um, and unfortunately, um, we also have to care now very much about negative human impacts on both of these. These wonderful animals are why we are all here and why we have been here all week. Um, but there is more. We care very much about sharing information and about mentoring. We learn and then we teach. 
and this ethic has been at the heart of our society since its very beginning, embodied by our very first president, Dr. Ken Norris. And I must tell you, I do not think that we could be luckier as a community than to have his leadership and his fellowship. And like many in our, com our community, Dr. Norris mentored his students, who then became members of our society, and they grew up in the society, and they mentored their students, and so on and so on. So we are a multi-generational community, as Dr. Randy Reeves just told us. And I want you to think about this, because if you're a student or a new member, or a new and young investigator, or a leader or an educator, um, know that you're likely beginning that tradition, which will help build and broaden and sustain our community. And since 1975, the year of our very first biennial conference, we have grown and diversified in almost any way that you can measure and define. Um, and our community is strengthened by that diversity. And we all know that we will become stronger as we continue to dedicate ourselves to enhancing the inclusivity and diversity of our society and our community. Our community is also strengthened by supporting the work of our members across the globe. And we also know that we will become stronger as we continue to enhance these critical efforts. And we are well on our way. Whoops, back. We are well on our way um, as we have been dedicated, each and every one of us, to these ideals. We all work really hard. I mean, that is a truism about members of our community. And we volunteer. And we also build capacity. And we help solve difficult problems. But we can do more, and we must do more, because we have very important work to do. Our society's mission is to promote the global advancement of marine mammal science and to contribute to its relevance and its impact in education and conservation and management. And we are utterly dependent upon each other to achieve this mission. As the beautiful and amazing Calvineers told us earlier this week, we are all interdependent organisms. So here's to moving forward together, to meet new challenges, to make new discoveries, and to ensure that the welfare of marine mammals and of the community that so cares deeply about them across the globe is ensured. Thank you very much. The last thing on the agenda will be two of my newest and bestest friends, <laughs> Hillary and Tanya. They're attacking from both sides. Oh. Hey, Hill, how you doing? Hey, G, not too bad. It's kind of hard to believe we're uh, nearing the end of our conference. I know, eh? <laughs> oh, hello, folks. <laughs> Bonjour. Hello, how are you all doing today? Yeah? yeah? Woo! You didn't really think we were gonna leave without one last word now, did you? Uh, for all of you standing outside the curtains, come in, have a seat. Uh, we promise you the award ceremony will start soon because uh, we're gonna be really brief. Okay, so we just wanted to leave you all with some final words of wisdom. <laughs> so here is our advice for future conference chairs. First off, organize with someone you like. Someone who might just be as crazy as you are. Yeah, yeah. Bring it in, Tanya. <laughs> Bring it in. <laughs> but maybe don't feed her too much coffee. I had so much coffee, it wasn't even funny. Find the right people to help you survive. We could not have survived this without our partners in crime, Sophie and Danny. Thank you, guys. <laughs> of course, you need to enlist a Jarrett. Because, as you've already heard, our Jarrett was amazing. <laughs> and he's going to be available at the uh, closing celebration for selfies, so make sure you find him there. <laughs> he's not in the room, is he? <laughs> make sure you have a fantastic team. So we want to say thank you to our incredible organizing committee, the scientific program committee, all the associate editors, the student affairs committee, the society board members, the World Trade Convention Center, the AV, the ge general service people, and experience, especially Kim Rhodes and Michael Smith. All of you for your guidance and your patience throughout this crazy adventure. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you all.
make sure you get some awesome support. And we had incredible sponsors and exhibitors, and thank you so much for helping make this conference a success. And most importantly, you need to have fun. And, and actually, Sophie and Damien, if you guys want to come up on stage, because uh, we had a lot of fun with you. So come on up here. You, you need up. to be up here with us. Come on. That's right. Get over here. Get in here. Get in here. Yeah. <laughs> so we hope folks have been enjoying Canada. And having a blast in Nova Scotia and in Halifax. We hope you've learned lots and are having so much fun at this conference. Because you know what? We're certainly having fun, right? Yeah, high, fives, fun, high, high fives, fives. A lot of fun, high fives, high fives, fives all around. <laughs> perfect, perfect. And the thing is, we're really feeling the love. I've never been hugged so much in my life. So thank you to all of you. Yes, thank you to all of you. We love you. But alas. Alas. <laughs> it is with heavy hearts. But a lighter workload. <laughs> that the time has come to take, to off, take our off our hats. Woo, oh, we gotta take off. <laughs> and to hand the reins over to your 2019 conference organizers. But don't worry, we leave you in good hands. So dear colleagues and friends, never forget, you, you are, are all awesome. awesome. <laughs> and we're, we're done. done. We're done. Woo! We're done, guys. Do, do I see a motion to close this meeting? <laughs> everybody. Can you say everybody? Did, a second? Does anybody second that? Everybody seconds it too. All in favor? Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. We are running, we are running a bit tight on time. So I'm going to talk particularly quickly in a particularly Scottish accent. So just agree with everything I say. First of all, I would like to go through the, um, the awards that have been given out intercessionally and the awardees are not here. So you do not need to clap at every turn of the slide. You have already heard our plenary uh, talk from the Wood Award, which is for a manuscript published in Marine Mammal Science. There is a second award also for the best student manuscript submitted to marine mammal science that describes innovative research related to marine mammal habitat and ecosystem conservation. This year, the winner was Brianna Wittenweem for her paper, Trophic Niche Partitioning and Diet Composition of St. Patrick Finn and Humpback Whales in the Gulf of Alaska revealed through stable isotope analysis. If you wish to be considered for either of the journal awards, there's a little check, a tick box, that you can tick when you submit your paper to the journal. The Robin Best Award is presented in memory of Robin Best, a respected marine mammologist who concentrated his research on South American species with a major focus in Brazil. This award is presented for the best student presentations given at the Biennial Conference of the South American Specialists in Aquatic Mammals. The 216 overall winner is Carla Calderon for her presentation on the first records on the parasitic fauna of the South American first seal from Punta San Juan, <coughs> Peru. The Emily B. Shane Award supports conservation oriented non-harmful field research on free-ranging odentocetes and serenians, especially those aimed at habitat and species conservation. The 2016 award round had two winners, Shambhu Podell for his proposal on understanding the effects of artisanal fishing on the ecology of the Ganges River Dolphin in Nepal, and to Federico Sacanza for filling a conservation gap bycatch estimates of the Franciscana dolphin in southern Brazil. 
for all of us. Um, Jay, if I could ask you to take your position. Um, so these are for everyone, uh, for some awards awarded here at the conference and also pre the conference. I hope that everyone here is on the list. Um, if not, we'll swiftly move on. Um, so first of all, for the Heining Award, which is given to the best proposal received from an established researcher to investigate any area of cetacean integrative biology. Last year's winner was Rachel Rassicott for predicting hearing sensitivities of beaked whales using inner ear morphology. Rachel, are you here? Doug has already gone through um, the process of the small grants in aid of research. Although we do not have all of the recipients here with us today, these are some of the, um, our awardees who couldn't be here. But those who are, I'm going to call you all to come to receive your certificates from Jay. Carlos Dominguez, Gwyneth Penry, Penry Christina Casillas, Mauricio Cantor, and Mariana Adrada. Now this year we started um, a new award through the conference app, which was the Audience Favourite Award. And um, thank you very much, Katerina, for getting that in place on time. It worked beautifully. Um, so for our Monday award, please can I ask Michelle Forney to come and collect her prize. Her talk. The Tuesday Award goes to John Kalambakidis. <laughs> and Wednesday's Award, which was my personal favourite, Dave Rosen. And the Thursday award was Casey Clark. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, Friday award cannot attend, but we've arranged for his body double to come and collect the award for him. So Friday's winner was Ari Friedlander. So now, moving on to the student awards. Lost my place. For the best doctoral talk, Charmaine Hamilton.
And I would also like to say Charmaine was the winner of the Stu Innes Travel Bursary. For the best student poster, Stephen Chan from Hong Kong. And for the best student speed talk, Kirsten Thompson from University of Exeter, England. And next, moving on to our pre-doctoral candidates for the best talk, Emily Humble from University Bielefeld, Germany. And for the best poster, Karen Back from San Francisco State University. Um, I would just like to say a huge thank you at this point to the over 150 volunteer judges who went to every single one of our student presentations this year to make the judging for our students as in-depth and as interesting as it has been. So please give yourselves a, a round of applause, all of the judges who participated. For the next few awards, we have smaller uh, dedicated committees. So first of all, um, this award, the Stephen Leatherwood Award, who is a vocal advocate for regionally driven research in the Asia region. The Stephen Leatherwood Memorial Award was established in 2007 to promote Steve's desire to further marine mammal conservation in Asia by recognizing the most outstanding research presentation on Asian marine mammals. Ocean Park Conservation Found Foundation Hong Kong, which Steve set up in the early 90s, um, supports this award and also supports the travel of Asian students to this conference. And the winner this year is Yi Han from the Institute of Hydrobiology, China. Did I? Oh no! Sack me! <laughs> Moving back in time. <laughs> um, the best student speed talk award is for Sarah Straubel, University of California, Santa Cruz. <laughs> Oh 
Uh, may I now invite um, Carol Fairfield or one of her team to come on the stage. Thank you. On behalf, on behalf of Fred's family, his colleagues, and the brilliant and supportive panel of judges that helped us this year with the Fred Fairfield Memorial Award, I'm honored to present two awards this year to acknowledge innovative techniques, innovative techniques by a student. <laughs> we'll start with our runner-up. Um, and our runner-up will receive um, a plaque and a monetary um, gift uh, to continue on, and also a banquet ticket. And I'd like to, um, I'd like to first say that some of us did have some uh, conflicts of interest. So if any of our judges did, we pulled ourselves out of any of the nomination or uh, voting for the winners. That said, our runner-up. Um, is Casey Clark from the University of Alaska Fairbank. Oh, okay. Oh, that's, a, that's fine. Um, and this year's winner, um, we're very proud to announce the, uh, for the 2017 Winner of the Fred Fairfield Award is Chris McKnight from St. Andrews University. <laughs> and if our, if our winners would just, um, after the award, step over to the side, we'll give you a check. <laughs> May I now invite Katie Moore onto the stage to talk about the IFA Award for Marine Mammal Conservation and Welfare. Thank you for this opportunity to be here. I know it's late, but I'm going to take two minutes. I timed it, two minutes. So first, I'd like to thank um, our conference hosts and the wonderful team that puts this together again, and also a tremendous thanks to all of the judges who helped us do the judging for all of these different talks. Uh, for those who don't know us, the International Fund for Animal Welfare is a nonprofit organization, and we're dedicated to the rescue and protection of animals around the world. And we're a little bit different than some of the other conservation organizations in that we believe that welfare and conservation can and should go hand in hand. And we believe in the value of the individual animal both intrinsically and within the context of conservation. We work across many species, from tigers to elephants, but marine mammals are special to IFA. The organization was founded not far from here, in New Brunswick, Canada, in 1969, uh, to fight the commercial seal hunt here. We currently have a broad marine conservation program working on issues ranging from uh, sharking issues and uh, ocean noise to commercial whaling. We also have an active marine mammal rescue and research team based on Cape Cod, Massachusetts, on the east coast of the United States. Uh, you may have seen several of our staff here this week presenting on some of our work. Within all of the work that we do across IFA, we strive to ensure that all of our work across species and across disciplines is based on a solid scientific foundation. This week, our esteemed colleagues have told us about the plight of the vaquita, the steps taken to conserve monk seals, and the very recent dramatic loss of 16 North Atlantic right whales, cases in which we know every animal matters. For many marine and terrestrial species, we're at a tipping point. We can't wait until there are a few hundred, or God forbid, a few dozen individuals to sound the alarm. We know that if we wait too long to act, it could be too late. For the conservation of many species, every animal matters right now. And for the welfare of individuals, every animal matters always. In an effort to promote an integration of welfare and conservation in marine mammal research, we're presenting the IFA Marine Mammal Conservation and Welfare Research Award to that full-length oral presentation that best utilizes robust science to improve animal welfare and conservation. And we hope to make this an, a regular award at each biennial. While the true gem is a lovely whale statue, <laughs> lovely whale statue, um, it, the award does include a two-year grant for continued and expanded research. 
It is my pleasure to present the 2017 IFA Award to Lucy Keith Jine. the wrong way. Um, this year, we had a brand new award format, and I would like to invite Damien on stage to talk a little bit about that before we announce the winner. So my job isn't quite yet done then, okay. Um, yeah, video presentations. Um, so I need to acknowledge where this uh, idea, this thought came from. A few years ago, I committed myself to entering this competition called Oceans 180, which uh, reached out to scientists to present a peer-reviewed journal paper um, uh, using video, using video footage from the field, animation, interviews, etc., in a creative manner. And to do that in three minutes, and also to uh, be able to get your research uh, re across in a scientific way, but also to be able to make it accessible to um, seventh to ninth graders, because they were the ones that were marking these uh, videos. So I did actually did that, um, and I got close, but not close enough. So then anyway, I thought it'd be a great idea to bring this to this conference because this is um, well, something that I'm sort of developing a little passion about is bridging this gap between art and science. And so this is uh, video presentations is a way to really uh, think about your research, what are the messages you're trying to get across, how, what video uh, techniques, animation, etc., can you use to express your messages uh, to be able to, again, um, uh, portray your scientific uh, results, but also make it accessible to the public. And uh, this, uh, so we did have uh, 22 um, interested uh, uh, presenters who wanted to um, submit a video, and then at the end of the day, we, we had eight. And although I've been winning around like a, a, a mad ostrich, or a headless chicken, I don't know which one it was, but um, I didn't get to see all of them, but I did get to see some of them, and I, I was impressed. I was very impressed, and I really do hope that it does stay with us. So these videos were judged uh, for the content, relevance, educational value, organization, and technical and creative ability, and then we um, have a winner, we, we, we chose the best video of the eight. And I'm going to let um, Lindsay, shall I say? Are you going to say? Well, I don't have the title in front of me. Oh, actually, I do have the title in front of me. Um, the winner of the first round of these video presentations is Charlotte Dunn and her Bahamian, Bahamian sperm whales, smaller than average. So that is all for the awards today. May I ask the talk, speed talk, poster, Fairfield, IFA, and Leatherwood award winners to come to the table on this side of the stage um, so we can arrange your prizes. And finally, again, I would just like to thank my awards committee, Katerina, and all of the judges for making the awards possible this year. Thank you.
Uh, not so quick, Lindsay. A round of applause for Lindsay. She, she's lived and breathed this stuff. Thank you. See you all at the party.